for this kind introduction, uh, and uh, thanks to the organizers for this invitation. Um, I'm the founder of uh, the Commodity Discovery Fund, uh, but I've been a journalist for 20 years. I was born in Switzerland, so uh, being Swiss-born, we love uh, hard assets, we love gold, we love money. <laughs> Um, and I always said that Switzerland is a neutral country, uh, but the more I visit Dubai, I think Dubai is the new Switzerland, because Dubai turned out to be really neutral also in the latest conflict, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by that. Um, actually, I started to invest in Dubai myself, and I hope to receive a golden visa later this year, so I always feel very welcome here. I'm a student of monetary history. I've been stu uh, studying hard assets and fiat assets for 25 years, even before crypto was around. And I learned that no fit, the fiat currency ever reached 100 uh, birthday, year birthday, because all fiat money systems fail in the end. I also learned that every 90 years we get a new world reserve currency, and gold always proven to be the best hedge until Bitcoin came, ar came around. So this is a great visualization that every 90 years the world gets a new financial leader and uh, the US dollar has been around since 1944, so that's almost 80 years now, so we're in the last phase of, I think, the dollar as the anchor for world's financial system. Um, even ING Bank, the Dutch ING Bank, has put out some research telling the world that the BRICS countries might introduce a new world reserve currency pretty soon. So there's a lot happening in the monetary space. So I will, I will cover the monetary space. I'm also the author of The Big Reset. The Big Reset had an undertitle, The War on Gold and the Financial Endgame. It's about the coming changes within the international monetary system. And on the back cover, I wrote that uh, a system reset is imminent probably around 20. 20, we will see big changes coming to this uh, world. I've been a journalist for 20 years, worked as a market commentator for Dutch TV between 2001 and 2008, so that really gave me time to study the system a bit more. And I decided to stop being a journalist in 2008, right after the um, Lehman crash and the start of the great financial crisis. I moved over to the dark side, I started to Want to make some money. I um, started two companies. One was Amsterdam Gold, that's a bullion web shop. I sold it three years later when we had yearly sales of 100 million euro. Um, I, I started the Commodity Discovery Fund. With the fund, we invest in small companies being responsible for large discoveries in gold, silver, and also in the battery metals. So, um, uh, we, we don't have any gold discoveries in the Netherlands, but in Canada and Australia and even in Saudi Arabia and here in the Middle East, many new discoveries are being made. And we call this uh, the art of discovery investing. If you're, if you're lucky enough to buy into the right exploration company making a good discovery, you, some value might be created. Um, we had some amazing returns with uh, gold discoveries by the Grey Mining, Greatland Gold, both in Australia in 2020. So these returns, they're crypto-like re returns. So you can also have, um, you can also make good money outside the crypto space. And we focus on the top 100 of best and, un and still undeveloped uh, metal projects anywhere in the world. So. We don't care if they find gold, silver, or copper, or nickel, zinc. We take investments in them. And why are we discovery investors? Why are we resource investors? Because we love hard assets. We even prefer to invest in companies who still don't produce the metal. Because if you produce the metal, you'll have less ounces in the ground at the end of the year than at the start of the year. So we want to invest in companies who have more ounces of gold at the end of the year than the beginning of the year. And if we look at the last four decades, over 40 years, interest rates came down. And now we see big trends change. And why is that important? Because hard assets are now uh, outperforming the paper assets, paper assets like the US treasuries. And when you have this trend of lower interest rates, 
it means that stocks, bonds, and real estate go up. <clears throat> so now there's a trend change. The interest rates won't go down anymore, but in, they start a new uptrend. You'll see an end of the bull markets in bonds, stocks, and probably real estate. But you guys in Dubai are lucky because real estate prices came down the last 10, 15 years. <clears throat> If you compare that to Hong Kong and Singapore, they kept going up. So here, real estate just bottomed out, and that's why I started to invest in real estate here, because I think real estate in Dubai will do very well in this next cycle. But there are some risks. If we look at the asset prices, because of the declining interest rates, the asset prices went up on general, not in Dubai, but on general worldwide. So we have this huge bubble of asset prices. And now financial markets are in a bit of a shock because they were used to the declining interest rates and now they have to adjust to the higher interest rates. So we've seen the worst year for government, uh, for um, 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 bond investors. So if you're an institutional investor and so you have your portfolio in safe treasuries, you had a very bad year. Actually, this is one of the worst years ever. And if you look at What fueled this asset bubble? Well, of course, this is the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve up till, until the uh, Lehman crisis. Um, nothing much happened on the balance sheet, but then the US needed to create more and more money, QE1, QE2, QE3, and we had a huge bubble, especially after the start of the corona crisis. We've seen and a very strong increase of the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, but we've also seen that with some other central banks. Why do we have such a strong inflation now? Well, if you look at the monetary growth, M2, the monetary growth, what happened after the COVID crisis was uh, much more money creation, even compared to the 1970s, when we had the large inflation as well. So the inflation is really kicking in. We have the debasement of currencies and how do you protect yourself as an investor to the debasement of currencies? You do that by investing into hard assets. And I think Bitcoin is the best crypto hard asset of all. Um, if we compare the uh, phases of inflation which we've seen in the 1970s, We could say now we only experience the first phase worldwide. So I expect inflation to come down next year, but there's a risk. You have the second and third phase of inflation coming later in this decade. Um, if we look at the global financial stress indicator, you can see we reached low levels again. So that means there's a lot of stress in the financial system now. The last real crash of the markets was in March 2020 during the corona crash. We haven't reached that levels yet. I hope, I hope we won't reach those levels. Markets might stabilize now and don't be surprised to see another uh, boom market developing because there's so much money still waiting to be invested. Now government bonds aren't giving any returns. Now, many real estate markets are topping out, not in Dubai, but in the rest of the world. A lot of money might go back into stocks again, because stocks are good investments in a high inflation scenario. Um, I'm the author of The Big Reset. You might know The Great Reset. That book was published by Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum. I published my book in 2014. He published his book in 2020 and I still need to send him an invoice because he, he really liked the title. <laughs> um, now we are entering this uh, great reset. Uh, many changes might come to the monetary world, financial world. Um, I think all the crypto changes might be part of them. And some of the insiders, uh, William White is a really a very strong Um, um, a powerful force within the financial system. He, he's been a chief economist at the Bank of International Settlements in Basel, and he's been warning for some time that in the next recession, the U.S. debts over 30 trillion, over 31 trillion, will never be serviced or repaid. And this will be a bit uncomfortable for a lot of people who think they own assets that are worth something. So that's about the fight hard assets, 
confronting the paper assets, and I think that's a very important um, um, fight to, uh, to, to follow. Bill Gross, he was the founder of PIMCO, PIMCO being the largest investor and, and reseller of US bonds, is very clear now as well. There's a statement from September 21, he calls bonds, treasuries, investment garbage. That's a very strong statement from somebody who became a billionaire by selling US treasuries. Of course, central banks, they can print money, great business model, you can print money and you can buy hard assets. What have the central banks been buying since the fall of Lehman? The fall of Lehman was in 2008. We saw declining gold reserves with central banks till 2008 and after the Lehman crash, they changed their mind. They understood that fiat money was at risk. We had the debasement of currency trend and they started to add to their gold reserves. We see that in the Middle East, we see that in Asia, we see that in Eastern Europe. And the West, the Western central banks are not buying gold, but they stopped selling gold. And that's a very important sign. And of course, gold price reacted well to that environment. So we saw a huge rise uh, after the fall of Lehman. We've seen a retest of the uh, 2011 highs, around $2,000. Uh, if you're a bit of a technical analysis and you see this chart, you know once we break the old tops, you could have a strong run towards three, four thousand dollars So that's a very strong bull market now. But many people always ask us, why isn't gold rising faster? Why isn't gold going up when there's so much financial stress? Well, actually, we've seen the same. Let's go back. Well, after the fall of Lehman in 2008, gold declined by 30% during the panic. And then it tripled from 700 till 2000. I think we'll see the same now. And we know the US, Wall Street has been playing tricks. They sell a lot of gold on the future markets. We call that selling papers, paper gold. And the countries from the East are buying the physical gold. So there's a, there's a struggle there. Um, the, US, the US even said that JP Morgan's metal desk is a criminal enterprise by cheating and manipulating the prices on world markets. And if we study in, in our research department, we always study the amount of physical gold leaving the US, coming out of the COMEX system, COMEX being the future system in Chicago. And what you've seen since the start of COVID in 2020, a lot of physical gold is being asked by Asian countries, Middle Eastern countries, moving out of the US. So the question is how long can the US maintain their policy of manipulating the prices of gold? Keeping the price of gold low means you can Gold is the anti-dollar, so if you want to have a strong dollar, you need low gold prices, and that's the game being played. But Moscow and Beijing, they understand this, and they've been seeking a reconstruction of the current world order together. That's what they said already seven years ago. And if you look at the big changes since 2000, if you're blue, you had US as your main trading partner. If you're red, you had China as your main trading partner. Look at the changes in the last 20 years. So the world is shifting from the west to the east. The economic center of the world is shifting. And the yellow countries here are the countries who are using sanctions against Russia. But over 140 countries in the world don't support the sanctions. They, they're not a fan of Putin, they're not a fan of the war, <laughs> but they, are, they hate the double standards because we didn't put sanctions on the US when they invaded Iraq. We didn't put sanctions on the US when they invaded Afghanistan. So I think there's a big change. And the change to, from the West to the East is important because in, the, in the, the white circle, that's where half of the population lives. And if you make the circle a bit bigger, most of the people live in countries who don't support sanctions. Over six billion people live in countries who don't support sanctions. So we could have big changes within the international monetary system. And this analyst of Credit Suisse is even writing about we're witnessing the birth of Bretton Woods III, a new world monetary order centered around commodity-based currencies in the East. So this has been 
picked up by one of some of the major banks in the West. So after Bretton Woods 1 in 1944, Bretton Woods 2 in 1971, we're seeing big changes coming to the international monetary system. Mark Carney, who used to be the governor of the Bank of England, has been quite clear about this as well. Uh, Google, Google uh, his speech in Jackson Hole in 2019, and he is calling this an unsustainable monetary system. So the birth of the current US-centered US system was in Bretton Woods in 1944. 44 countries from the world, they all supported the US idea to uh, use the dollar as the anchor for the international monetary system. But they had to promise the, the dollar was as good as gold. And they, um, they failed on that promise in 1971 when they closed the gold window and took the dollar off the gold standard. And that's why gold is the anti-dollar since. And that is a big, uh, big struggle. So what could replace the dollar? What, what could be the new anchor for world's monetary system. Mark Carney said the dollar is too dominant. It could be replaced by a digital currency. Um, all Bitcoin and uh, well, crypto investors were all very happy to see this because they thought Bitcoin would take over. But um, I, I think they're wrong. Um, Bitcoin, of course, has seen a wonderful ride win a large correction now, I think. I still think Bitcoin is digital gold and everybody should have some Bitcoin in their personal portfolios. But I don't think that Bitcoin will be the new world reserve currency. There are too many, there are not many central banks who like to, to own Bitcoin. Uh, only El Salvador recently added Bitcoin to their central bank holdings. And central banks, of course, are working on their own digital currencies and they're working on central bank digital currencies. And um, there's a, a small, there's some advantages with central bank digital currencies, but there's also some risk involved because it gives central banks absolute technical control over your personal spending and your money. But um, we've seen, um, the IMF coming out with statements that um, they want to walk the route to test the central bank digital currencies, roll them out, and then use them as, I think, a basket of digital currencies, use them as the new world reserve currency. But of course, we still have the fight between the West and the East, and we still don't know how these tensions will affect these changes. Uh, the Bank of International Settlements um, has completed the first pilot with four countries, all using central bank digital currencies. Um, it's here, U United Arab Emirates, mainland China, Hong Kong, and Thailand. They work together to test these central bank digital currencies. Um, the latest reports say the test went quite well, so it's, it's, it's more frictionless to uh, transfer money worldwide. So this is, I think, the largest revolution we'll see uh, within the financial industry. So to end, to end this presentation, we can conclude that a monetary reset seems near, has been, um, has been ongoing for quite some time. I was always hoping that there wouldn't be any confrontation, military confrontation, economic press confrontation between the East and the West, so we all could join forces to make the transition as smooth as possible. But now with the war in uh, Ukraine and an even larger war fight looming between the US and China, um, we we'll, we'll, we'll might have some problems. Um, to see a very smooth transition. But we need to find a new anchor for world's monetary system because the dollar is, uh, is the power of the dollar will be declining. Uh, and the new anchor could be a, di a, a digital currency. Uh, it, it won't be uh, Ripple, it won't be XRP, it won't be Bitcoin. It probably will be a mix of central bank digital currencies. You could build them into a basket, have the IMF um, organize it and, and supervising it and, and I think that will be the new future for world's monetary system. 
Thank you for your attention.